Please pause for a while as we invoke the presence of the Almighty Father. Let us pray. O God, Creator of all things, Master of life, Fountain of eternal joy, we praise your magnificent name and express our gratitude for the gift of life that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful world you've made for us. Thank you to our leaders who show us the path of goodness. Thank you to our colleagues who teach us about friendship and make our workplace an enjoyable place to be. As we commence our endeavor, grant us wisdom and insight, openness and enthusiasm, humility and tolerance. May everyone be inspired in everything we do, and may your saving grace remain with us, so that all our prayers and efforts begin and end with you. Teach us endurance, Lord, so that at the end of the day, we can say, we lived according to your will. All this we ask and pray in your mighty name. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. In 2020 and 2021, up until now, 2022, the Philippines and the whole world faced challenges such as the pandemic, COVID-19, and Cebu Typhoon Uden. A lot of challenges, hurdles came up. Focusing on civil society organization, some of my colleagues went suspended. Some of my colleagues stopped their operations. Some of my colleagues continued their services. But basically, the common problem was sustainability and recovery. This and more. Welcome to the sustainability and recovery of the Philippine CSO sector, an online forum on the 2021 CSO Sustainability Index and the COVID-19 Recovery Agenda for the CSO sector. I will be your moderator and host, Mr. Eli Sabinay, at your service. So just to give you an introduction, of our discussion this afternoon. The 2021 Civil Society Organization or Susta Sustainability Index, the Philippine Report, was recently published by the international nonprofit FHI 360 in behalf of the USA. It is led by, here in the Philippines, by COCOS of Network of NGOs or Code NGO. The research conducted an online survey and deep dive discussion with the panel of the Philippines CSO experts on seven dimensions, and we will learn more of that dimensions this afternoon. Near the end of 2020, with CSO leaders from across the country, develop the cover agenda, which is very important for civil society organization. Introduce further the study and even the report, and to welcome the participants 
participants in Zoom, and even to our virtual space through the social media, because we are currently streamed live right now in Code NGO Facebook page. Let me call on the project of the program officer for advocacy of Code NGO, Mr. Sandino. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ellie, our moderator for today. Thank you, everyone, for making time to attend this online forum. We are very glad, very happy that our partners from government, the academe, social enterprises, international NGOs, and Philippine civil society made it here today, wherever you are in the Philippines or in the world. Welcome to the online forum on the CSO Sustainability and Recovery. This was initially titled uh, Levers of Sustainability for the CSO Sector. Our resource persons this afternoon shall talk about, as mentioned, what happened in 2021 in terms of CSO sustainability and the possibilities that may happen after this year's preparation on, on, of the agenda for recovery of the CSO sector. We all know the backdrop of our discussions later on. As mentioned, this is the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of what happened after more than two years in and out of lockdowns and imposed restrictions that affected our economy, health, well-being, and the way of life. Each of us carry our own story of struggles and victories, and it is clear that all of us are on the road to recovery from the effects of pandemic. That is why we will examine the factors of CSO sustainability through the CSO Sustainability Index or CSOSI and see if CSOs in the Philippines are worse or better off in 2021. And one response to last year's 2020 CSOSI report is to prepare and formulate an agenda as mentioned for the recovery of the CSO sector. After months of consultation among CSOs, we will launch today the COVID-19 recovery agenda for the Philippine CSO sector. We will then hear the thoughts, insights, and recommendations, and even commitments from our partners on each agenda item presented. At the core of the discourse is the role of development CSOs as advocates, as advocates and network builders. Advocacy, as defined, is about speaking up, speaking truth to power, being a voice for a certain group in society that are usually voiceless. Consider that the forum is a venue to provide the CSO sector a voice to express and define sustainability, find ways to be sustainable, and articulate what it would take to recover from the effects of COVID-19 in these uncertain times. Here we shall also strengthen our current collaborations and form links to establish new ways of cooperation. I invite everyone to keep an open mind and heart throughout the forum and maximize the chat or comment functions to register your own thoughts and opinions. We are all excited to hear from all of our speakers and so again, welcome and praying that this forum shall be informative, interactive, and inspiring for you. Magandang hapon po. Thank you, uh, Sir Dino, for that uh, warm welcome to everybody's participants. So just to give you a bit of an expectation, why we are here in this online forum at 2 in the afternoon. So what is our objective? Basically, we want to reach as many CSO sector as possible to hear the 2021 CSO SI, the Philippine report. We would like to engage key stakeholders mentioned by civil society sector as a focus to present as well the COVID-19 recovery agenda for the Philippine sector and to gather, this is the most important, recommendations for improving sustainability and the Philippine sector. Thus, make sure you have your coffee beside you to make sure that you are awake the entire discussion. So we would like, I would like to recognize again our partners for this study, the Recovery Agenda and the Philippine Report, CSOSI. We have the Code NGO as the lead here in the Philippines. We have USAID, ICNL, FHI 360, Horus, and the EFD. So let's proceed to our presentation proper. We present the 2021 CSO Sustainability Index, the Philippines Report. 
I would like to welcome the editor, Miss Rory Francisco Valentino. Virtual applause, please. Thank you, um, Ellie. The um, the this the the CSOSI has been uh, done for now. This is the 2021 was the fifth year that it was done uh, for the Philippines. So over the five years, the idea was to track how the CSO uh, sector was doing. No? So the purpose of the of the 2021 CSO Sustainability Index is to help understand the pressures on and the dynamics of CSOs over time in a particular country and across regions and countries. So we want to measure program success and inform strategic planning. We also wanted to increase the ability of CSOs to undertake self-assessment and analysis and to assist in advocacy efforts. Next slide, please. Okay, what is the definition of CSO? For the purposes of this particular study, and this has not changed over the five years that we have been doing it, and this, the definition has not changed across the countries and the regions where the CSOSI has been, uh, has been undertaken. So the definition for this purpose is uh, a, a civil society organization exists whether formally or informally. So it doesn't matter if they're SEC registered, they can exist at the community level as well. The second, and this is very important, is that they're not part of the apparatus of government. So they're not, uh, the, the, the sector or the organizations are not, uh, are not given the blessing only by government, nor do they exist to, to push the government's agenda. The third is they do not distribute profits to their directors or operators, that they are self-governing. So the members of the board um, govern the, the organization and where participation is a matter of free choice. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Okay, in, the, in 2021, again, this is almost a whole year after, uh, after the fact, after this, the period that we're studying. So the coverage of this study is January 1st to December 31st, 2021. And it tries to highlight the current condition of civil society in a given country at that time. No? So the scores record the situation in the year that was examined. They should not reflect recent or historical progress or hopes for the future. And it looks at key events that happened in the year uh, that is being reviewed. And those are cited to explain the ratings or changes in the, in the scores. Next slide, please. Okay, the CSOSI measures the seven dimensions of civil society sustainability. One is the legal environment. Second is organizational capacity of the sector, financial viability of the sector, advocacy, the way they advocate or are they able to advocate. The fifth is service provision. The sixth is the infrastructure of the sector. And the seventh is public image. We will go through each of these dimensions one at a time to see where uh, we have been rated lower or higher. Next, please. The scoring process, no? This is how the CSOSI is scored every year. An expert panel of eight to 10 carefully selected individuals ensure a balanced representation. So, some of the expert, some of the panel have to be in urban areas. Some have to be in rural areas. The, uh, they, we try to do national organizations versus local organizations, big, uh, big organizations versus small organizations. Those whose uh, mission is advocacy versus service delivery, the types, the sectors across the seven dimensions. There is a consensus-based rating for each of the seven dimensions of CSO sustainability and the justification for each rating. So while this, the expert panel is meeting, they cannot not come to a consensus. If there are 
different ratings of, of the dimensions, then that has to be explained and the rest of the, of the, ex, of the expert panel has to be able, have to be able to, uh, have to be able to try to convince those that are not uh, in the consensus form to, to move their to move their uh, scores no? and again this is always based on what information they're able to share after that the CSOSI report the, the ratings and the justification are reviewed by the, the by the editorial committee which is composed of FHI 360 which is the um, which is the global organization that handles the the work that is done in different in all the different countries and regions, the International Center for Nonprofit Law, which looks at nonprofit law in each of the countries and has a and has a store of information on that, and USAID. Next, please. Okay. In terms of scoring, the CSOSI uses a seven-point scale, you know, with one being the highest level of sustainability and seven being the lowest level of sustainability. The scores are clustered into three stages, sustainability enhanced, which are scores uh, which range from one, which is the highest level of sustainability to three. Then sustainability evolving 3.1 to five and sustainability impeded 5.1 to seven. It, the Philippine scores were all clustered around sustainability evolving. So 3.1 to 5, the scores. And fortunately, we had no uh, dimensions that were sustainability impeded. Alternatively, we have no dimensions in sustainability enhanced. And that's been true for much of the five years that, uh, that CSOSI has been going on. No? And certainly, um, throughout the uh, period of the pandemic. Next. Okay, in terms of overall CSO sustainability, our, our score overall is 3.8, which is still sustainability evolving. We dropped a little bit slightly, the scores of CSO sustainability in general have dropped slightly, but uh, it, it has not, it has not dropped to the extent that, uh, that we have had to change our scores. And, and as, as I had said earlier, uh, the in the different dimensions, there were pluses and minuses. There were scores that dropped. There were also scores where we, where we did better. So in the legal environment, it's 4.5, which is sustainability evolving. If you'll notice, that's the worst of the seven dimensions in terms of score. Organizational capacity is 3.5, which is pretty good. Uh, financial viability is 4.4. There's been a slight drop in that because of, the, because of COVID. Advocacy, 4. Service provision, 3.4. Sectoral infrastructure, which we rate, which, where we rated highest, the infrastructure of the sector, 3.1. And public image, uh, 3.4. Should we go into the next, uh, into each of the dimensions now? Okay, in, in legal environment, which is the first of the seven dimensions, this refers to registration of the, C of the sector and of, of uh, CSO organizations. It's operations. It also looks at state harassment, if there is, taxation policies with reference to the sector, access to resources, and local legal capacity. Uh, next, in terms of legal environment, we rated 4.5. As I had said earlier, uh, there's been a dip in that particular, in that particular uh, dimension because of the continued red tagging and targeted actions by government, such as freezing bank accounts and state-sponsored killings. No? Uh, that's a minus. A plus and minus is the DILG Memorandum Circular 2021-12, which required clearance from PNP and AFP for CSO participation in government activities. There was a pushback from the CSO sector 
and the memorandum circular was amended to MC 21, uh, 2021-54, removing this particular requirement of clearance uh, from PNP and AFP for participation. Another plus and minus were the community pantries. We've all heard about the community pantries, which started in April of uh, 2021. This was temporarily paused because organizers feared for the safety of volunteers after hearing accusations from police that they are communist or communist fronts. The Supreme Court uh, ruled, and this, is, and this also was a plus or minus, that the ATA was constitutional except for two provisions. Those provisions had to do with um, those provisions had to do with uh, uh, can't remember uh, if the two provisions that that were ruled unconstitutional was uh, the uh, oh, the 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 ATA was constitutional except for two provisions no while in 2020 there were two bayanihan to heal and bayanihan to recover programs which put into place uh ayuda for the poorest of the poor to help them recover from uh, from the effects of COVID in 2021, uh, while a third was supposed to have uh, to have been instituted, the uh, the Bayanihan the third tranche of the Bayanihan to heal was not uh, was not approved, and the budget that was supposed to be used for it was put into the build 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 program instead. Uh, on the premise, government thought that build, build, build program would, in, would ensure uh, uh, jobs created uh, in the sector. Okay, next. So that is for the legal environment. There was also continued red tagging and targeted actions by government, such as freezing of bank accounts and state uh, and state sponsored. I'm sorry, can you move back one slide? Okay. Oh, Sandino says the co two constitutional ATA provisions, the qualifier of dissent with intent to cause harm as a terrorist act, and the designation of a person or group as a terrorist based on the request of another country. Thank you very much, Dino. Can we then move back uh, one slide from this? Hindi pa yata tapos yung ano, yung legal. Okay, uh, uh, no, it's going, go back. Before that, yeah, there was continued dread dagging. Okay, uh, okay, we're done with that. Next was, the next is the organizational, was it? The next slide. Organizational capacity. This refers to our ability as a sector to, to build our constituency, our ability to do strategic planning, our internal management of our processes and our, and our operations, our staffing, and then technical advancement in the, within the sector. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, Organiza in organizational capacity, we were rated 3.5. It was a uh, slight increase from last year of 3.6 because it was felt that through because of the pandemic, CSOs adjusted the ways that they worked given travel restrictions and COVID testing and demonstrated adaptability and resilience as remote work continued. In other words, uh, the sector strengthened collaborations between foundations, community-based organizations. It learned to use social media, webinars, online forums, which it didn't, it was unfamiliar with when the pandemic started. 
CSOs also recalibrated strategic plans given the uncertain situation in the field. However, the minus is internet access remains a challenge in rural areas. No? And this was seen in the five years that this study had been going on. It continues to be, uh, to be an issue for, uh, for CSOs, especially in the rural areas where internet access is very poor. Next slide. Okay, the third, uh, the third uh, dimension is financial uh, viability, which includes uh, di diversifying sources of finance, uh, getting local support, getting foreign support, being able to fundraise, being able to earn income from, from its funds, and its uh, ability to have uh, necessary financial systems, financial management systems. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? In financial, in financial viability, we rated 4.4. If you'll notice from the graph, it went down one, uh, one percentage point, no? Because uh, in the time of the pandemic, foreign funding became less consistent. Foreign funding, corporate donors focused on, on their support for COVID-19 response and recovery. So uh, CSO uh, regular operations were not top of, top of mind for funding. Human rights defenders, however, experienced no significant change in funding, recognizing the deteriorating hum uh, human rights situation. So the donors of human rights organizations in the Philippines continued to fund uh, human rights organizations no? because they saw that human rights in the, in the time of Duterte was uh, particularly imperiled. However, many other CSOs were drained of limited resources of their limited resources, but the easing of community restrictions or the beginning of the easing of community restrictions helped uh, CSOs look for more income. They began to prepare for recovery. For instance, Code NGO prepared the, uh, for the COVID-19 recovery agenda near end 2021. And you'll hear about that from Bert Aquino in a little bit. Okay, next. Next, please. Okay. In the fifth uh, dimension of civil society sustainability is advocacy, no? which means cooperation with local and national governments, policy advocacy initiatives, lobbying efforts, and advocacy for CSO law reform. In this particular uh, dimension, we ranked, please, next slide. We ranked 4.0, which was the same as last year. No? There was a, the, the context was challenging for advocacy you know, because of the human rights deterioration, disinformation, and the shift to online advocacy, which is harder to do than um, in-person advocacy. Uh, on the other hand, the sustained advocacy, despite its challenges, including combating misinformation or disinformation, making government accountable for the use of COVID-19 response funds, promoting clean and safe elections, agenda building, that continued to take place even through uh, online forums and, uh, and online work. So, so there were th two things that balanced. No? There was something that was negative and also something that was positive. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. The sixth uh, dimension was service provision. Uh, the service provision was a range of goods and services provided by the sector, its responsiveness to the community, its being able to develop consist constituencies and clientele, cost recovery mechanisms, and government support and recognition. Next. In service provision, we were at 3.4, which was the same as last year. No? Uh, it, it, the, the negative was that CSOs had not yet fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels of service provision. No? 
So some CSOs were forced to abandon some of their usual programs due to financial concerns, as well as government restrictions. However, CSOs went beyond traditional clients and services to meet urgent needs. So there was a, a real uh, pivoting to, uh, to much more um, community need, uh, need response no? of a CSOs. After the vaccine rollout, CSOs were able to resume services in varying degrees no? because there was no longer as much of a worry about catching COVID or catching COVID and, 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 make, and having it become serious. And then the last one, the last dimension is a sectoral infrastructure. I know this is not the last dim dimension. No? This is the sixth dimension. So sectoral infrastructure is the intermediary support organizations, training programs, CSO resource centers, local grant making organizations, CSO coalitions like Code NGO, training for CSOs and intersectoral partnership. On sectoral infrastructure, we ranked 3.1, which is the same as the year before, the first year of COVID. So plus and, plus and minus infrastructure report remained unchanged. Online capacity building activities and programs were provided in 2021, such as Lead to Serve, Grow Co-op by Agritera, CSO2, Save by Save the Children. Smaller and more rural organizations, however, still struggled to access some of these opportunities, opportunities given their lack of reliable internet connectivity and ICT. Okay. And then uh, the last one uh, of the seven dimensions is public image. Uh, it, it, this includes media coverage, public perception, perception of CSOs, government and business perception of CSOs, public relations, and self-regulation. On this, we did better than before. Well, it was the same as last year. However, the CSO response improved public relations of their mission and work. We were, we were much more highlighted in the consciousness of, of, of communities and the general public because of things like the community pantries, which they felt was a real uh, answer to the needs of the times, medical and assistance for non-COVID concerns. No? EON's public, Philippine Trust Index, which we use uh, every year, uh, said that public trust in NGOs rose from 37% in 2020 to 70% in 2021. However, media coverage of CSO work remained limited and it was worsened by the ongoing crackdown on press freedom. Okay, that's it I think for uh, the presentation of CSOSI. Is there another slide? No more now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma'am Rory, for that very comprehensive report. Uh, personally, I affirm the report myself because the pandemic did not just challenge us, uh, our sustainability did not just challenge us badly, but it also challenges us in terms of how do we upscale, how do we upgrade amidst the legal environment, which is very challenging. That's why some of the seven dimensions, some were up some and that is a good reference for us as we move forward which will be our next staff center which will discuss and share to us the COVID-19 recovery agenda for the Philippine CSO sector. Let me call on the project steering committee for Albert Aquino. Thank you Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for um, the introduction. Good afternoon sa lahat ng mga nandito ngayon. I am tasked to present the COVID-19 recovery agenda for CSO's uh, Philippine CSO sector, which we developed uh, by Code NGO with the support from Foros and uh, 
French Development Agency. The developmental, uh, the development of this COVID-19 um, agenda for Philippine CSOs so resulted from the desk review of the local studies conducted by the Association of Foundations Philippines and the partnership of Philippine Support Service Agencies on COVID-19 pandemic on uh, civil society organizations in 2021. Uh, we also reviewed the CSO Sustainability Index, uh, Philippine reports in 2020 and 2021. That was written by Code NGO Networks uh, for the FHI 360 and USAID. We also conducted roundtable discussion with panel CSO leaders and experts, and also some members of the project uh, steering committee. And the series of validation workshop was also conducted uh, with about 104 CSO leaders from 12 CSO networks based in six major geographical areas in the country. The four main guide questions that we use in the formulation and consultation and validation of the agenda are as follows. Uh, number one, um, are there any recovery uh, challenges or issues not covered by the agenda? Number two, how can its uh, provision best support the CSO network or sector's objective? And three, what agencies, institutions, or stakeholders do we need to engage to give these provisions the best chance of success? And number four, what might a successful collaboration look like? What role can uh, the organizations play in the recovery agenda? Any at the end of the project, the Philippine CSOs would have claimed spaces for recovery of CSO network uh, or the CSO sector from the impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic and the government response to it through the following objective. We have set uh, three objectives. No? to collectively develop the COVID-19 recovery agenda for Philippine CSO sector with CSO leaders from different geographic areas and sectoral groups. And to number two, to represent or present the recovery agenda to key stakeholders in government, corporate, academe, and other CSOs. And three, to obtain the commitment of key stakeholders to support the agenda to adapt or to implement selected policies, programs, and projects uh, stated in this agenda. The CSO sector plays a critical role in addressing the historical and existing social inequities exacerbated by crises like uh, what we had uh, before, no? uh, two years back, the COVID-19 pandemic. But despite the health risks and community quarantine restrictions, many CSOs adapted and innovated to provide emergency response and services to our communities, especially the vulnerable ones for the past two years. However, the COVID-19 pandemic also affected many CSOs, causing the CSO sector to struggle to recover to even survive in some cases. And many has to um, make uh, things or ends met for the continued employment of the staff, continued their programs and services in partnership with their communities. Hence, the CSO sector must forward this development agenda to address the needs for immediate recovery and continuation of uh, its development work. So we present now the seven um, recovery agenda. Uh, we start with the uh, first, can we move now to the next slide, please? Can we move now to the next slide, please? Okay. Agenda number one is um, formulated like the CSOs must engage the government to call for further assistance to CSO sector to comply with regulatory requirements. There is a need to provide further assistance to CSOs to meet regulatory requirements of government, 
the COVID-19 pandemic caused significant delays and difficulties in the annual updating of CSO registration or submission of reportorial requirements with various government agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Cooperative Development Authority, the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Social Welfare and Development. But despite the measures implemented by most regulatory agencies to ease the requirements and the processes for CSOs, some CSOs continue to face challenges with the new and additional administrative uh, procedures, particularly those that are online. Related to these challenges, CSOs request that these agencies uh, may consider the penalties or fines imposed to CSOs. To address these challenges, the concerned agencies may also set up a possible set up or pop up offices around provinces to deliver the assistance to CSOs. Also, in addition, CSOs also request to enable the CSO desk officers in the LGUs as mandated by uh, the LG Memo Circular 54 last year to provide competent and technical assistance to CSOs to assign online facilities also in the LGU offices, which the CSOs can possibly use to submit uh, their uh, reportorial requirements to concerned agencies. The issuance of department order will probably help facilitate this concern from these agencies. Generally, CSOs find is effective if regulatory agencies ensure timely processing of requirements and uh, regulatory reviews of regulatory requirements or regular reviews of regulatory requirements and the smooth operability of electronic system as there were observed to be glitches in uh, its engagement. We proceed now to the next agenda, agenda number two, on CSOs must engage the Philippine government to call for uh, protection of civic spaces for CSO operations, uh, participation, and communication. It is believed that it is important to protect uh, not to constrict the civic spaces of CSO operations, participation, and communication. Civic spaces is fundamental in the democratic society. And the uh, 1987 Constitution of the Philippines promotes and protects the rights of CSOs for effective and reasonable participation at all levels of social, political, and economic decision making. The local government code, for example, of 1991 and the Annual Appropriations Act highlight the need to provide spaces for citizens' participation in governance at all levels. Open civic spaces are integral to the recovery of the CSO sector. For us, it is um, important so that we'll be able to peacefully assemble, freely associate, and fluently express our views. The CSO sector can help improve the governance function on service delivery and governance, especially for the marginalized sector, if government can really operationalize the partnership with the CSOs. So we move to the next uh, agenda. Uh, the next slide, please. Agenda number three, CSOs must engage the government and private sector to support the digital transformation of CSOs operations. We need greater support for digital transformation of CSO operations. During the pandemic, many CSOs adopted new ways of working with partner communities and other CSOs by utilizing digital platforms. However, internet access remains for me, uh, as difficult uh, or challenge for many rural communities. Government and the private sector can possibly invest in this area in technology and infrastructure to expand digital access in uh, rural communities. Majority of CSOs lack the capacity in this area to utilize digital tools and applications to achieve 
effectiveness of its internal and even external communication also. Government agencies, we call on government agencies like um, DOST, the DICT, DTI, the state colleges and universities, or even private sectors or other accredited centers of uh, TESDA, and maybe also CSOs specializing in information and communication technology can provide capacity building program CSOs on digital advocacy, digital literacy, data privacy, and digital security and other related areas of concern. Uh, here, we also believe that CSOs needs to adapt institutional policies on digital security, data privacy, and internet cyber crime as uh, necessity already for CSOs. Uh, the next slide, please. Agenda number four. CSOs must maximize resource generation mechanism to sustain CSOs operational cost and um, for their programs. Uh, this has always been a challenge for us. There is a need to maximize our resource generation mechanism to sustain operational cost uh, for our program. Because grants from in, uh, international and national entities and philanthropic initiative shifted to the pandemic response and humanitarian work, funding opportunities for many CSOs becomes limited as experience. CSOs can possibly band together to um, research new or possible uh, development uh, of other scheme for financing uh, models. CSOs can also reprioritize funding strategies or diversify funding sources. For example, CSOs can develop uh, fee-based services for the private sector or even to government agencies and LGUs and uh, possible also for academic institutions. National and local government can possibly supply also CSOs with the list of unutilized government funds such as the People's Survival Fund, which we know that is poorly touched, and uh, Climate uh, Change Adaptation Fund, and align with CSO's programs and advocacies, and also provide information or technical assistance on how to access this fund or similar others. Also, government can supply restricted funding opportunities to CSOs to, for devolved services uh, with LGUs. Discussion around this area regarding CSO participation and public financial management of LGU may be organized uh, with partners in partnership with national government agencies like the DBM, the ALG, maybe the DOF, and NEDA. Uh, we can try to also explore this. Government can also possibly develop better incentive for donor community to invest and work with CSOs with good internal governance practices in the country. International development partners can also possibly reconsider their policy on mandatory cash counterpart contribution as many CSOs are having problem um, addressing this. So let's move to agenda number five. Uh, CSOs must engage the government uh, or fellow CSOs in the private sector like the academic institutions and professional associations to provide mental health and psychosocial support services to CSOs. It is a felt need that these services must be provided to CSOs as experienced during the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted this risk that would affect the mental health of frontliner or full-time workers in health facilities. Uh, not only professionals, but also non-professionals in the health and allied profession, such as nursing aides, even janitors, paranga health workers, and others, and even our poor uh, population. The pandemic also significantly disrupted the delivery of health services, including mental health services uh, that was experienced. DSWD can probably integrate mental health and psychosocial support services to its social protection program uh, down to the provinces and in the rural communities. 
DOH need to fully implement Republic Act 11036, otherwise known as the Mental Health Act of the Philippines, whose implementing rules and regulations would have been already signed into law in mid-2018, and um, it should have uh, already took effect um, in that year also. CSOs also advocate to LGU to develop guidelines um, to promote community and uh, recovery-based approaches and delivery of culturally appropriate mental health services to its constituency, particularly because the law that we mentioned earlier states that the LGU should provide community health services beginning in 2019. CSOs also um, can conduct awareness raising campaign on mental health and uh, well-being to target um, communities. CSOs can also you know, provide um, partner with other CSOs with academic institution or professional associations with already have resources and expertise in delivery of mental health or psychosocial services to our partner communities. Next slide, please. On agenda number six, we believe that CSOs must also strengthen the collaboration and partnership among ourselves and with other stakeholders to respond to community needs along a common thematic areas. We need to strengthen the collaboration and partnership among CSOs and other stakeholders to respond to community needs along common thematic areas, which we work uh, uh, all around. During the pandemic, CSOs and other stakeholders organically or maybe sp others spontaneously collaborated to monitor the government's uh, COVID-19 response effort. Uh, monitoring budget allocation and spending to address pandemic related health and livelihood and even economic um, challenges that are experienced down the line and to build accurate data on the pandemic's uh, impact. CSOs can um, explore also more opportunities for collaboration and partnership with the private sector, the academy also and the scientific community for network building knowledge, learning, and information sharing, and convergence of effort in order to optimize, optimize or uh, probably scale up the reach and impact of programs and projects, uh, especially in our vulnerable population. So the last um, slide or the last uh, agenda, agenda number seven, is that we believe that CSOs must increase visibility uh, in our work or affecting our work. We believe that there is a need to increase our visibility or the visibility of CSOs and our work because it is timely and continuing uh, pandemic response and humanitarian work. Now we realized that CSO sector garnered increased public trust as people and communities felt their active presence in many communities since the pandemic struck the Philippines uh, in uh, 20, in uh, first quarter of 2020. The increased awareness of CSOs, we hope that this translate or this may translate to increased public trust, which may result in the increase of financial support from either the government or our traditional um, donors. But national and local government, or even the private sector and academic institution can also publicly recognize their partnership or engagement with CSOs if they have uh, experienced this during the last two years in addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. CSOs can also engage the Philippine Information Agency and the media groups to feature and possibly amplify the advocacy and its program and related to the public image building of CSOs in partnership with government, CSOs can also strategically and uh, be more actively uh, to continue the participation in local special bodies and other uh, participation mechanism uh, in the various level of local governments 
uh, in the different provinces uh, all throughout the country. So those are the seven um, agenda that uh, we uh, are presenting to you this afternoon. And uh, I now turn you over to Eli, our moderator, to help us uh, guide the discussion on the reactions of our colleagues uh, to this seven point agenda. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, Sir Albert. Great presentation indeed. And I agree. While watching and listening to Sir Albert, I'm just nodding my head. Yes, I need agenda one. Yes, I need agenda two. Almost the seven agenda is what we need in CSO. I myself has been working as a CSO worker, development worker for the last seven years, and I totally agree with the seven agenda mentioned. But before we proceed to the reaction, I observed that we started 88. Then after that two presentation from Mam Rory and from Sir Albert, we are averaging almost 130 to 133. And by the way, I would like to inform everyone we are stream live in code NGO FB page. So if you have friends, colleague uh, who is working in CSO, please share this to them. Share to your timeline, post this to your social media pages, or even organization so that they will reach us. And that is the objective as well of this event, to reach as many CSO as possible. And as your moderator as well, I would not miss and would love to see your beautiful faces. So before we proceed to the reaction, may I request everyone to turn on your camera for a quick group photo. No? Baka pwedeng ma-on yung camera natin lahat for a quick group photo lang. Great. On my end, I see six panels. No? So that means for a lot. Thank you. Thank you for turning on your camera. Sige. So who would take the photo? Would it, would it be okay, Julia, if you can take the photo? I'll be taking the photo. So please hold your smile since we are a lot. Okay. In three, two, one, smile. Okay. Second panel. Three, two, one, smile. Third panel. I like guys, because you don't know three. what panel you are. Two, one, smile. Okay. Two more panels. Three, two, one, smile. And then last. Oh. And one more. All right. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for the beautiful faces. Sometimes when we always go Zoom, uh, my colleagues tell me we became Zoombies na daw. Zoombies na. So let's proceed. Uh, based on Sir Albert's presentation, the seven CSO recovery agenda, uh, which was comprehensively explained. And from this, we will hear reactions from directly related organization and agency in relation to the agenda enumerated. And I would like to remind all our reactors, because there are a lot of reactors, credible reactors this afternoon, to formulate and state your reaction in three minutes. So let's make it concise and brief on your reaction based on the agenda mentioned. So let's start with agenda number one. Uh, agenda number one, as you can see in the screen, and our reactor are from the Security of Exchange Commission. The first one is the Chief Counsel of the Anti-Money Laundering Division of the Enforcement and Investor Protection Department of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And our second reactor, which is also from SEC, uh, she's the Security Council too, and one of the youngest uh, female lawyer in Commission Enforcement and Investor Department of the same organization, still with Security Exchange Commission. Let us welcome our first two reactors for agenda number one, Attorney Daniel Luis Macalino and Attorney Maria Bernadette Baranda Basilon. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on behalf of our director, uh, Oliver O. Leonardo, uh, the Enforcement and Investor Protection Department of the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, would like to commend the efforts of the Code NGO and congratulate you in advance for coming up with the COVID-19 recovery agenda and 
we are hopeful and we are with you in uh, praying and hoping that you will be successful in improving our scores because uh, um, we are also uh, uh, we would also like you to succeed um, as the corporate regulator here in the Philippines. So firstly, we would like to show our appreciation to the code NGO for helping the CSO sector and um, recognize its con con uh, contribution to the development of our country. And the SEC is committed to work with the code NGO and our CSO partners to make sure that they will be successful. So um, we at the SEC, in, uh, particularly in the department, we can remember that uh, last year we had the we had a, a session where we we were invited by the code NGO to provide or to um or we were given by the code NGO an opportunity to. Uh, uh, conduct an outreach with their uh, member organizations. And we cannot thank them enough for giving us that opportunity. And uh, ever since, uh, since 2021, we have been conducting uh, 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 webinars, uh, seminars, not just here in Metro Manila, but across our um, uh, offices uh, across the Philippines. So we we hope that we could continue that partnership in providing uh, capacity building sessions for your member organizations and if necessary, te technical assistance. You know, the SEC is not just here in Metro Manila. We have uh, offices uh, across the Philippines, especially in highly populated areas. And we also have strategic uh, satellite offices uh, across the Philippines. And these offices actually have uh, staff dedicated to ensure that um, the people that will go there will be able to ask questions, especially considering the fact that we are um, pushing for digitalization. Uh, digitalization, yes. So just come by our offices and I'm, we're sure that someone will assist you. And also, um, we would also like to um, commit, actually, that um, or recognize the fact that there are some regulations that right now that we need to continue uh, conducting outreach on uh, in order for us to make it clear uh, for the CSOs to understand what is being required of them, considering the fact that the Philippines is also being monitored internationally on how um, its regulators, such as the SEC, in, ensure that uh, our S, uh, CSOs uh, are protected from illegality as well as terrorist financing. So we are um, we are we we actually uh, conduct audits, not as an investigation, but rather in order to be able to see. Uh, what the gaps could be, and in order for us to be able to uh, give our guidance so that uh, 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 they will be able to uh, comply with uh, standards set uh, internationally. So with that, we thank you, and um, we would like to, uh, I, I think there's a comment here that uh, about the uh, the phone number. Um, rest assured that uh, the higher of the the office or our bosses are aware of that actually right now that problem, and we in fact receive dozens of calls, and we 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 recognize that we could do better. Uh, we could not say that uh, okay because there are so many calls, uh, uh, we would just uh, rest on our laurels or just. Uh, go deal with it no we the, our actually our leadership have recognized that and are actually making uh, significant changes in order to address that so um we with, with that we we thank you and uh, good afternoon okay so i'll go right ahead attorney daniel um this is just in addition to what attorney daniel said uh once again we'd like to thank 
Code NGO for inviting us this afternoon. And uh, as to your agenda one, we really do commend you um, in, in enhancing the capability of your CSOs to comply with the regulatory requirements. Um, since 2020, the SEC has been transforming uh, into digitally. So we are no longer accepting um, hard copies or face-to-face -face transactions with the general public. And we understand that there might have, there are, or there might have been some difficulties in complying since not all of our, not all of our non-stock non-profit organizations have access to, you know, laptops or good internet connection. But as we, as uh, we go along, um, it is important for all of us to, to, um, to adjust to the changing times. And because that we are, because the what ha the pandemic has brought to us, uh, we need to you know um, comply with whatever uh, changes that might have come. So we hope that you could also assist each other in in uh, in your technical compliance with regards to regulatory requirement. Going into the details, um, um, we also would like to encourage um, everyone here who is a registered done stock. Uh, corporation with the SEC that have not yet complied with their mandatory disclosure for or the MDF, we would also like to encourage you to still comply with uh, this, regula this regulatory compliance because um, um, we issue fines so so that you you could also you know prevent yourselves from being fined and also with our CSOs or organizations members member organizations here of Code NGO that are not yet registered with the SEC, we encourage you really to register with the commission as it gives you a juridical personality to, to, to transact uh, for your own, uh, for the corporation and not for the, its officers and members. And also for, for you to have um, the, necessary, necess the necessary powers that the revised corporation code can give to an ordinary registered Corporation. So sa mga hindi pa po dito, mga civil society organizations na maaring hindi pa po registrado sa SEC, ina-encourage po namin kayo na mag po kayo sa amin para kami, kayo, po ay amin, ay, kayo po ay amin niyong magabayan and matulungan po sa inyong purpose. Thank you. And thank you, Attorney uh, Bernadette and Attorney uh... Daniel, for that reaction. I agree. Uh, we all need the support, uh, all the needed support from the Securities Exchange Commission. And I would like also to reiterate what Attorney Daniel mentioned, that technical assistance support from SEC is very needed. And also for recognizing that there are regulations that needs more to be coordinated with the CSO. As you mentioned, uh, SEC will help us, no? will help CSO organization to identify the gaps and how can CSO fill it by through SEC guidance. So thank you, Attorney Bernadette and Attorney Daniel, for that reaction to agenda number one. But before I proceed to agenda number two, I would like to, uh, I'm reading kasi also the chat box in our Zoom chat box. If, you, if you're reading, uh, I see commitments already and next steps. So I would like to acknowledge and thank Doc Lelan Joseph de la Cruz for expressing potential collaboration and support from the Ateneo de Manila University on digital transformation and mental health, which is very important and badly needed for CSO right now. And also acknowledge Ms. Magdalena Lopez for, for her comments saying there needs to be a way to have a centralized and open platform where documentation from completed CSO programs to include capacity building can be accessed so others can learn from it. We need to have a better way to learn from the past so that we can design their programs and i totally agree with that thank you thank you guys thank you please continue uh we can discuss while listening on the chat box and let's see and learn from each other because that's the intention make this a platform for collaboration not just among csos but even to our government right now let me proceed to the reaction to agenda number two uh our reactor is from the department of budget and management uh let us uh, welcome, Assistant Secretary uh, Rolando Toledo. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Elizar. Yes, uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. And of course, uh, 
thank you for inviting us uh, or specifically me as a reactor to this online forum on the 2021 CSO Sustainability Index. You know that the state and the civil society engagement has long been existing in the Philippines. As a founding member of the uh, uh, Open Government Partnership or the OGP, we recognize that the active engagement of the citizens is a key uh, ingredient in achieving the goals of government initiatives. So through, uh, through the OGP, uh, we have further enhanced the state's civil society engagement uh, as we re recognize that an effective government puts the people first in its undertaking. Now, consistent with the OGP values of transparency, accountability, public participation, access to information technology, and innovation to strengthen governance, the PHOGP was able to provide a platform for direct engagement uh, of our uh, engagement of our CSOs. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, an equal number of CSOs, which is eight in all, sits as member of the PHOGP steering committee along with the members from the government. So CSOs are able to provide policy direction to the PHOGP activities through this, uh, what we call the multi-stakeholder forum. So also PHOGP work largely involves the, in the co-creation of the national action plan that is being uh, uh, put forward into the OGP central. Complementation of government programs and projects, and of course, even the monitoring of and a reporting on implementation of these government programs, projects, and activities by the CSOs. So the rigorous process of co-creating an action plan includes what? Regional consultations with the non-government sector to come up with the citizens' agenda. And this is the basis for the open government commitment under the action plan that aims to what? Respond to the demand of the citizens on the ground for government to deliver more transformative and uh, being felt. Uh, so citizens' participation is the core of the PHOGP uh, government programs and projects that were enrolled under the action plans in the past, um, the past five years now, uh, which uh, we have a lot of uh, programs that were enrolled in the National Action Plan, okay? Uh, included reforms to other programs and reforms, of course, to included uh, to uh, reduce, of course, bureaucratic red tape and the ease of doing business, the citizens participatory audit from COA, which was recognized globally as an OGP Bright, Star, uh, Bright Spot Awardee. And, uh, other things like, for example, the uh, extractive industries, transparency initiatives, and the seal of good local governance of the DILG. So those, uh, also at the local level, uh, we have also the open local legislative process through the open legislation platform via social media and website as committed by the provincial government of Albay, Bohol, and Surigao del Norte, among many others. So as a matter of fact, there are already uh, around 65 commitments in total over the last 10 years in the five national action plans that we have implemented. So again, PHOGP is identified as the main consultation platform of the uh, participatory governance cluster of the cabinet uh, that was created under executive order number 24 series of 2016, whose primary mandate is bridging the government to the citizenry through active engagement. Uh, so with these gains uh, in the opening of the government, the DBM secretary is committed to push for the institutionalization of the PHOGP through uh, the issuance of an executive order. This will ensure the, that open government reformers can more effectively leverage the process, the spaces, and resources of PHOGP in order to drive progress towards a more open government. 
Another one is we have reestablished the CSO desk in the DBM. This is to serve as a full, uh, serve as a focal unit for all concerns related to CSO participation in the budget process. So that will, of course, provide assistance to enable CSOs to participate more meaningfully in the budget process. So uh, we are also planning to have this CSO forum to really part of this, the capacity building as far as the CSO is concerned. Uh, at the local level, you know for a fact that there are already existing mechanisms for citizens' participations are being enhanced through the local special bodies and the DLOG initiatives. I don't want to preempt, the, uh, of course, the response from our DLOG colleagues. So those are some of the uh, uh, processes or platforms that uh, CSOs can participate nationally and locally. Now, despite the, cons uh, the concern of uh, constricted or shrinking civic space in the country that was presented in the report. We in government are sustaining our efforts in building partnership with the non-government sector, including development partners, pushing for reform initiatives that put uh, citizen engagement to the fore, such as the capacity building programs to CSOs I mentioned to you, embedded in the implementation and mechanism of the Mandana's ruling and the opening of our processes for a more transparent, accountable government. In fact, uh, I just attended this morning the USEID Decentralization Policy Conference, a high-level dialogue on public participation policies and options. So the change project of the USEID, which is the uh, project of cities enhanced governance and engagement, a USAID funded activity aims, um, among others, to empower citizens by increasing their participation for CSO uh, in an oversight of local governance processes. This goes to show that civic space for CSO operations, participation, and communication has been and is being protected through the concerted efforts of government, development partners, CSOs partners themselves, and even at the legislation, legislators. As a matter of fact, just to let you know, some of the bills being proposed, or rather is in the Congress on the table, is already a lot of bills. Here are among the others are the an act providing a framework for citizens participation in the legislation process through the use of the internet and for other purposes. Another one is an act establishing a framework for citizens' participation in legislation and rule and rule making through the use of ICT platforms, and also an act institutionalizing the participation of CSOs in the preparation and authorization of the annual national budget. These are among are among others bills that being uh, uh, brought to uh, discussion at the committee and even at the planner level. So I think uh, this is how probably we can also, as probably the help of our CSOs who are CSOs in uh, ushering this bill in Congress. So with that, I thank you once again for this opportunity. So let us all stay safe and God bless. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Asek Toledo. No? Thank you for mentioning as well Open Government Partnership, which DBM plays a crucial role and through that OGP, it really values and recognizes CSO as a valuable resource to the country's direction and on development, and also mentioning DBM's commitment and support the PHOGP. And also, you mentioned the CSO desk office, which is very important right now, streamlining the participation of CSO in budget process, not just in local, but also national. Great job. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ASEC Toledo, for that Welcome. amazing reaction. Proceed to agenda number three. Ali, nakamute ka. Apologies. So for agenda number three, in behalf of USEC uh, SIGE of the ICT, uh, may I call on uh, Lauren Valdez, 
who will give her reaction in behalf of Yusef. Hi, thank you, Mr. Sabinay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lorraine Valdez from the Department of ICT, and I would like to uh, extend our apologies that Yusek Giselle won't be able. Uh, she just stepped out the Zoom call, but she was actually here earlier uh, before 2 p.m. Because uh, actually today is the confirmation of our secretary, so we're actually here at the Senate. But nonetheless, of course, we'd like to extend our congratulations to Code NGO for organizing and coming up with this uh, report and this session that we can discuss about uh, this uh, initiatives and the global um, um, efforts of the uh, CSO. Uh, first, uh, I'm here to share with you the view of the of Yusek Yusel Batapasige that uh, CSO plays a very important role and also an important partner of the government, both in the national and in the local level as movers for innovation. Um, Yusek Yusel, as the civil society org leader, um, really uh, help and support and really share the view of the CSO as a lawyer, she is a protector of human rights, specifically for women and children, and an advocate for innovation. The portfolio of the Undersecretary for ICT Industry Development under the uh, DICT um, includes a vast um, or very wide intervention in terms of the ICT development in the country. It um, the portfolio includes ICT Industry Development Bureau, which is a bureau mandated to provide um, interventions, um, support and promote, uh, develop support and promote the ICT industries, particularly the ITBPM industry, the startup industry, the online freelancing industry, and the emerging technology industry, and um, helping it create a robust ICT ecosystem for the ICT industry. Um, also, part of the portfolio is the ICT Literacy Competency Development Bureau or the ILCDB. It is the bureau that's focusing on the upskilling, reskilling, and right skilling of talents in terms of ICT. Um, another part of our portfolio is the ICT policy, which is under the NIPSB or the National ICT Planning Policy and Standards Bureau. These three bureaus actually as um a, provides a holistic approach in terms of providing um the right ecosystem the right landscape for the ICT industry as the USEC for ICT industry USEC yourself wants to uh, let everyone know that uh, she is very much willing to support the digital transformation agenda of the CSOs and of course extending and um, telling everyone that the ICT is ready to help the CSOs to provide skilling trainings for uh, trainings and programs and um, also um, just recently would like to inform everyone that the Philippines won actually a seat in the ITU in the ITU Council. Uh, ITU is the um, ICT arm of UN. So in, it is a contested um, seat in the ITU. So for the fifth time, the Philippines was actually uh, elected or uh, earned a seat in the ITU to among the 193 uh, member countries, only 48 uh, member countries were actually chosen. And in that um but in that avenue uh, i would like also to share the that the philippines um through its commitment to the itu uh, is working on and um working on initiatives in terms of uh, women and youth the digital innovation for women advancement or diwa is actually a um initiative um of the philippines to focus on advancing um digital uh, empowerment and innovations uh, among women tech and um, uh, actually for next week we will be launching this project and also we'd like to share with you uh, our initiative for the youth development for or Gen Connect. Gen Connect is the youth arm of UN uh, of ITU where in the Youth, the members of this organization are actually gathered across the uh, global on the global level to uh, make sure that the um, that the youth are actually heard in terms of developing the ICT agenda in the on the global level and also implementing it and making sure that they are part 
of the plan, the agenda, and that uh, they will also uh, benefit from the ICT agenda on the global level. And with this um, commitment of the Philippines to the ITU, um, the DACT uh, would like to explore partnership and collaboration with CSOs in working with uh, the advocacies for women and uh, youth. So with this, uh, we really, again, would like to congratulate uh, everyone who are actually here uh, in this event and of course the organizers. And we want to reiterate that the DACT fully commits and supports to the digital transformation of the uh, CSO. So that's all and thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, uh, Lorraine, for uh, stating the, the commitment from the ICT in behalf of USEC Giselle. So, number one, I would like to reiterate what was mentioned, no? uh, that the CSO was recognized as movers of change, movers of, sorry, movers of innovation, which is, I totally agree, and also the startup through your ICT industries prioritizing the startups and your willingness to support the digital transformation as mentioned in Agenda 3 by providing capability building, capacity building for CSO organization and to being open for possible partnership with CSO promoting the youth and women advocacies. So thank you once again, uh, Lorraine, in behalf of USEC Sege of the ICT. Our secondary after for our agenda number three, uh, is currently a professor at the Department of Information System and Computer Science, School of Science and Engineering in the Ateneo de Manila University. So may I call on Dr. Maria Regina uh, Regina Estuar. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Okay, so first, thank you for the invitation to provide a reaction regarding agenda number three. I'd like to congratulate Code NGO for um, um, this activity and thank you for the opportunity to provide um, my reaction. Um, I, I think the first uh, important aspect is to maybe understand um, or maybe um, emphasize the foundations of digital transformation. Um, and from an academic perspective and from my experience um, leading um, the development, design and development of digital platforms for social good, I see it as uh, having four, uh, four pillars. First is infrastructure. Of course, it's very important that before we promote digital transformation, that the infrastructure for digital transformation is there and is available. It has to be inclusive, meaning it has to be um, accessible by everyone and by everyone, meaning even the, the, the disadvantaged groups. Um, and there should be alternatives in case um, the, the, the infrastructure fails. No? Um, another aspect is, of course, um, um, infrastructure is not a job of one group only. It is uh, really um, a private and public partnership. No? So uh, similar to how it happened during the pandemic, there was great cooperation in providing uh, infrastructure because that was one of the, the gateways um, for providing information and access to information, among many other things. Um, so that is very important. First and foremost, the infrastructure is there. Second would be the platform. What will we use for digital transformation? Um, there are, of course, free platforms, but we have to use them with great caution no? in social media platforms because um, they are free and they are not owned by us. Uh, therefore, there is um, uh, there is. Um, um, opportunity to abuse the platform. No? So um, the platform should be designed, of course, uh, for people so that uh, they will be familiar with similar technology. So when the design should be similar to social networking platforms, um, because people are used to using these types of platforms already. Next foundation would be the content and the features of the platform. Again, for digital transformation to be effective, it should have the features that are needed by CSOs for their operations. No? And, and of course, um, for the content, um, 
just dividing it into three, no? uh, data collection should be available, um, data analysis should be there, and of course, data reporting should also be there. Lastly would be the people who will be using and uh, the platform and operating the platforms for digital transformation. So that would mean capacity building. So there should be um, in the portfolio, in the agenda, um, a, a budget and time and space for capacity building. First is to measure the adoption of the technology of the persons or the consumers of these platforms. Next would be literacy, privacy, uh, understanding data privacy and data security. And lastly, which is I think the most important one, is understanding the value of the data. Um, next item would be um, levels, the levels of digital transformation. How do we know if we are transforming? First is if we are using the technology as a tool for daily operations. I think we are here at this level. We use email, we use messaging platforms. Um, the fact that we have leveled up into creating groups using these messaging platforms and creating spaces to share information is a, is a big step already. Next would be digital content. We should know the, the value of data, data as a product for decision-making, policy and planning. No? So this is where we want to be able to produce um, the, the correct analytics, correct models, and of course, eventually inclusion of mach machine learning algorithms and AI where it is needed okay, to help um, uh, fast track or to make processing more efficient and decision making more efficient. Third would be the public as consumers of the digital product. So one way of looking at digital transformation is not just the operations, but how we serve the people. And the most, I guess, the most tangible would be G uh, the, the mobile money, no? um, how it has been, um, how it has evolved during the pandemic um, among the other things which, which we should develop in the digital ecosystem. No? Digital citizenship, no? so this is where collective action um, is important. Um, we know that we have transformed if uh, uh, the citizens are able to participate in the digital space um, uh, as part of the information providers and information consumers. So this is where technologies like block blockchain uh, can uh, help make um, make the data and the transactions secure and make people more accountable. Um, lastly, would be digital spaces for partnerships and collaboration. So this is where we should push for open data, where um, government agencies, CSOs, and academics would provide data for uh, and analysis and corresponding analysis, including limitations and scope and limitations of the analysis for the public to consume. Um, points for reflection. There are five points here. First is the side effects of digital transformation. So we are pushing for digital transformation, but people should be aware of the side effects of digital transformation. Our dependency on this one means that there will be constant surveillance. So the fact that we have provided so much of our information um, during the pandemic, we are now receiving the side effects such as um, several uh, messages in our mobile number, no, which we don't know saan siya nang galing, um, because our, our data has been um, um, shared with everyone. Second would be, um, we should ask if social med media is still a good tool to gather public opinion. So siguro early on, uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was pure. Okay, but now um, maybe we should decide on which domain it is still relevant. So for example, for disaster response, maybe, um, but for other things, maybe we can look at other platforms no, for, for gathering public opinion, primarily because of um, um, opportunistic uh, uh, groups who, who use the, the public, public uh, platforms to uh, provide wrong information. Um, next would be um, the information producers. We should be aware that the information producers reflect also reflect their biases and agenda. No? So, so we have to learn and, and teach the public how to understand the data that they are seeing um, in the public spaces. Um, start from within. So within CSO's operations, hire hire experts not to make sure that you have them on board or partner with these experts from the academe 
or from the government. No, Leland already volunteered, no, <laughs> Ateneo. Um, and, and so, um, ganun po, yun yung maganda. No? So if there's no plantilla for these experts, if you if you're going to use the data and the platform uh, as as a uh, um, the main drivers of your digital transformation, you should have people in place to make sure that the data is managed, the data is protected. Um, you have the correct analytics and models um, to use for your operations. And also um, you, have, you, have, uh, you can sustain no, these projects. So Kaya ba natin? We are a developing country. Uh, um, I think the goal, uh, the the answer here is to partner, no, with the academic and scientific community. So the last item would be just examples of how we have been able to help, no, CSOs in various ways um, uh, during our work um, with uh, with the different uh, NGOs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doc Rina, for guiding us through and for providing in detail, no, the reason. Uh, why digital transformation, the needed requirements, and what should be if we go to digital transformation, reminding us that this is not just advantage, that there are also disadvantages that we must be aware of. Thank you, Dr. Rina, for that insightful uh, reaction. Now let's proceed to agenda number four, which is quite a lot, and we have three reactors for this uh, particular portion. So let me call on our three reactors at the same time, then... Uh, I'll call first the first reactor. Uh, he is uh, the former executive director of Code NGO, now the executive director of Foundation for Sustainable Society. Uh, I'm going to mention all three, then uh, follow na lang after. No? Uh, our first reactor is Mr. Sixto Donato Makasayet. Our second reactor is from the DILG, uh, Sir Richard Villacorte. Uh, while our third reactor on this particular agenda number four, uh, Still with us from DVM, uh, ASEC, Orlando, Toledo. Let's start first with uh, E.D. Sexton. Yes, salamat, uh, Eli, and uh, thank you, Code NGO, uh, for inviting me uh, to react to this, uh, at this forum. Uh, well, first, I, I, I must say that no, no, the agenda includes mentions uh, well, regarding resource generation mechanisms. Uh, for CSOs, it mentions fee-based uh, services, mentions government funding for CSOs, it mentions uh, flexible funding uh, from international development partners, and I must, I, I, well, I agree with all of those, I think all of those are important uh, for, for, for CSOs to be able to generate the resources that uh, we need for our services for our, to continue what we do. Uh, I just like to share maybe some, some some points that I hope will help uh, us as we try to implement or promote that agenda. And, and basically, that that for me, that the two questions that are important are uh, what what is to be funded. So what what is to be funded? The other one is who will fund it? Or who who will pay? And, and when we say what is to be funded, I think what's important is if you're looking at uh, if you're trying to design. Uh, resource uh, generation mechanisms. Uh, so we, we first have to determine uh, whether the the service or the good that we trying to deliver as an NGO uh, is excludable or not. No? So that's some. Well, basically, the, the term excludable simply means that can we exclude? Uh, can, is there a practical way to exclude those who do not pay uh, for those goods and services? No. Uh, well, simple na naman yan, di ba? Kasi kung, kung, hindi mo kaya, kung, kung hindi mo kaya exclude yung mga hindi nagbabayad, mahirap madinay ng fees uh, uh, for that service, di ba? Kasi, well, uh, kasi nga may, hindi, mahirap, hindi mo naman, hindi mo naman ma-exclude yung mga hindi nagbabayad. Uh, and that's what we call the free rider phenomenon. So, so ano yung madali? Uh, examples of excludable, excludable goods are uh, student meals, di ba? Student meals, you can exclude those who do not pay for the student meal or housing, uh, you can exclude. Uh, you cannot. You can exclude from benefiting from the housing program. Those who do not pay uh, for the housing program. And non-excludable will be uh, advocacy for, for example, for good CSO laws uh, on taxation or on regulation uh, or on, on uh, or, or for uh, human rights policies. Yeah? 
Kasi hindi mo naman pwedeng exclude yung mga hindi nagbayad ng advocacy or hindi nag-contribute para ng advocacy. Uh, so, so, so mahirap mong mahirap ka maningin ng peace para doon. So what is to be funded? And, and that's related to, uh, well, if it's excludable, then we can think of, can we deliver this as a fee-based a, you know, fee service? Uh, and, and the challenge there will be, uh, how do we make it affordable? And how do we make it of good quality so that people, the, the community that we want to serve, will find it uh, beneficial for them to, 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 to pay for that service or for that good. Um, to pay for that service, for that good uh, from 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 us. So, if yung ano, di ba yung mga para entrepreneurial mode ng for deliver ng service or ng good. Uh, how do we, for example, the student meal? Uh, how do we make it uh, nutritious, good tasting, and and affordable so that uh, if that's our service, so that uh, people will pay for that uh, for that service or your housing. How do you make the housing uh, decent, uh, affordable, so that people will pay for that housing? Uh, and so, so na talong do sa sa talong ng fee-based service naman ay paano yung mga hindi kaya talaga magbayad, no? kasi mababa talaga yung income. So that's where, so who will pay for that? Right? Because they cannot pay for that. And if you want to include them in the service, then we have to find others who will pay for that service. And it, 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 mga sponsor, you know? uh, sponsors could be uh, government. Uh, government to pay for that service. It could be business organizations. It could be donors uh, who can be individual donors or institutional donors who will pay for the like, school feeding program, for example, uh, that are, that is supported by others, you know, not the ones who are getting the meals, but the, the, the others who will, who will pay for that service uh, so that the students who need those nutritious meals will get will get paid. Uh, so you know, so, so that I'm done. even if you can even if you can uh, ask for fees uh, for the service, uh, uh, do, do the beneficiaries that we want to target, do they have the capacity to pay? If not, then we have to look for others who, will, who are willing to pay for that, for that service. Yung susunod na, and then, you know, yung kasi related in to maintaining the operational cost of the theater, di ba? And when we ask for payment for those services, we have to be sure that we cover our costs, so not just the direct, the direct cost of the cost of the meal, but also the indirect cost of uh, of the revenue well, salaries and the, the, the other administrative overhead cost of the NGO uh, if we want to sustain the NGO. Uh, then the second question is, what about those that are not excludable? The you know, more policy, advocacy, etc. Then again, we and, and we cannot ask for P for services for those for peace for those services there. Then we again go back to sponsors. Can we ask government to pay for that, business groups, donors, institutional or or individual? That's what 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 is to be funded. The other one is who will fund. And we've already mentioned that and that the, the list. No? But I'd like to zero in on two. Uh yung government that I yung yung well the individuals through through crowdfunding uh well, because of the lack of time that we have now so government uh, uh well we all know that government has five trillion pesos uh in in, the, in their budget every year so that's a substantial resource base uh and if they see the importance of cso's in the work of government and even in participatory governance then we should ask the government to also help uh, fund the work of uh, CSOs. And, and the government is open to that. I, I was in the same forum with ASIC Toledo uh, this morning, as uh, participatory governance, decentralized governance. And we heard uh, mainly uh, the openness no, of uh, government, for example, to fund uh, the capacity building of CSOs. Uh, and uh, also you know, participation in governance. So, so we have to, that's an important advocacy that we have to all work on. But, but, the, 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 but we have to remember all the challenge there is, of, well, one challenge always is how do we maintain CSO autonomy and uh, the inclusivity of all CSOs in, so that there's no favoritism, even while we're being supported uh, by government funds. 
yung second uh, is yung crowdfunding. So, donors, so meron traditional donors, institutional donors, but there are also individual donors. But usually, dati, it will be the more, uh, well, the better better off who we, we, we will think of even, uh, to, as individual donors. But well, because also of social media, because of the payment platforms, there's a greater possibility now for crowdfunding a smaller amount. Right? Uh, and and the, that's also one, sort of one, one alternative that says those can look at. How do we maximize that possibility for crowdfunding from uh, many people in, uh, donating smaller amounts? Uh, but so we have to build up that base. If you ever see it, so we have to think of how do we build up those um, supporters? It could be supporters because of the of what we do, you know, of, uh, because they're supporters of the environment, the current environment, or advocacy uh, for uh, good governance. Uh, but they can also be when we were you know still for the NGO, one one learning that we we saw was that people are also very attached to their locality, you know, to their hometown uh, or home province. So maybe uh, that can also be um, how do we also maximize that people who are interested in the development of a particular municipality or city or province, how do you also crowdfund for that, you know, for local development? Uh, but the, the one, one, well, one requirement for that is that we must be trusted. You know? they, they won't donate uh, if they're not trusted. So we have to ensure good governance among ourselves, we have to ensure effectiveness also. They must see that we'll be able to deliver what we promise in terms of development. But in challenge them is because many of us are, well, we have good governance, right? we do good work, but few people know us. You know? So that, that's another chance. How do we communicate? How do we communicate this effectively uh, and, and they, they, so that they trust what they hear uh, from us? And I think that the CSO networks, because this is hard for small CSO to do on their own, right? the communication of what we do, uh, of why we should be trusted. So CSO networks like Code NGO and the members of Code NGO, I think have an important role to play in this. Plus, yung mga certification bodies like PCNC or some other certification body that will help uh, people to trust uh, uh, CSO so that they support us. Yung last point na lang, uh, long term, uh, but I think we have to start, well, we've already started and we have to continue starting. But long term, uh, yung, yung law policy changes or changes in the law yeah? or, or new laws. Uh, uh, we, we started some time back when I was still in Kyoto NGO an advocacy for law, which would allow taxpayers to identify CSOs of their choice and part of their tax would be would go to those CSOs. And this is being practiced in some European countries already. Right? So part of your income tax return, you identify the CSO that you want to support, and part of your tax payment would go to that to, to support that NGO or PO. Uh, this was also a similar, a, a law similar to this was offered by Senator Obama Pino, uh, but oh, well, it hasn't passed yet. So maybe that's something that we need to look at also. Uh, the second one is yung income tax uh, laws natin. Uh, in other countries, if you if you put up a business as an NGO and you use the earnings from that business to support your mission, that is not subject to income tax. In the Philippines, even if you're an if you're a tax exempt NGO, if you put up a business, that that the income from that business is subject to income tax, just like any other regular business. So maybe that's also something that. So, but these are also, of course, because these are laws, uh, this will take years, but we have to start, I think. So, maraming salamat for the opportunity. Thank you, Sir Dodo. No? Uh, if you listen carefully to what Sir Dodo mentioned, there were a lot of brilliant ideas suggested, not just to the CS on how to maximize resource generation and mobilization, but also local government units, both national and local, on how to support CSO funding. Great job. Thank you, Sir Dodo. Let's proceed. There are changes on the program. So we'll proceed to agenda number five, uh, which will be our reactor is currently with the South Wellness Institute Southeast Asia and also the convener of Wellbeing Philippines. May I call on Mr. Kirk Castro. 
You're on mute, sir, Kurt. All right. Okay. Can you guys hear me? All right. Thank you very much. So, yes, uh, there is a very uh, there is a very strong need for MHPSS to be streamlined. Uh, it, I think it's an integral and essential service that we need to really focus on, especially how the pandemic created this very strong impact on our mental health. Actually, one of the things that the Wellbeing Cluster and our organization, Gestalt Wellness Institute, has provided a very, what we call as unified system here in the Visayas in providing mental health and psychosocial support since June of 2020. Now, it is very important that I think CSO as a, as a body, an influencing body, should pursue the promotion of community and recovery-based approaches in the delivery of appropriate mental health services. As mentioned with your program, I mean, with your agenda, I think it is very appropriate to go down to their grassroots when we implement MHPSS. MHPSS should be culturally assimilated within areas from Visayas, Mindanao, and Luzon. And because why? Because we are, okay, we are culturally different within our national culture. And it is so important that each cultural concern in each provinces should be addressed accordingly. I, I also believe that developing a unified system of MHPSS response together with the NDDRMC, DSWD, DUH, DPED, CHAD, DALE, DILG, LGUs, the CSOs and professional organization is necessary. Why? Because right now what is happening is that our MHPSS response is non-standardized, okay? Uh, in fact, the United Global Mental Health Services under the United Nation and WHO has created a global policy and guidelines on how to implement MHPSS. However, if you notice, there is different implementation from DSWD, there is a different implementation under DUH, and there is also different implementation under professional organizations. And I think MHPSS as a necessary response to most mental health situations under emergency and disaster responses, I think it is so important for CSO to lead the unification of this system because supposedly one of the most important aspect in MHPSS response is actually a coordinated response. Wherein when disaster strike, okay, whether, whether it's a pandemic or whether it is an emergency situation, we already know who to refer to, who are the focus responders, who are the specialized responders, when and where can we work together with this specialized services. What is happening right now is that there is so much division and so much gap between referrals as well as responses from different agencies. So I think it's so important that CSOs are able to bridge those gaps, okay? So partnering and creating collaborative effort in the pursuit of a more unified MHPSS services, I think is our role here. Now, right now, together with SINVISNET, the Wellbeing Cluster and Gestalt Wellness Institute, we have rolled out an MHPSS facilitators training for CSOs under focus and community and family support services under the MHPSS guidelines. Okay, so it is so important that we are able to understand 
the basic principles of MHPSS, how it is being delivered, the, the continuity of the services available, the content, I mean, the context of the services being provided, as well as the specialized and focused services wherein psychologists, psychiatrists, and mental health providers are able to directly provide the necessary services in the community. And I think CSOs can bridge that by creating directories for MHPSS providers, by creating uh, programs that connect and bridges uh, responses in emergency and disaster situations. Now, also, it is so important that as care providers and it is very important that there is no, there is also the ability for CSOs to provide care for the carers. And this is actually being led right now by the well-being cluster, wherein we are not just responding to individuals experiencing or surviving certain emergencies and disasters, but we are also providing care services for individuals who are actually responding to those cases. So we have been providing debriefing programs for social workers, for doctors, for uh, firemen, for individuals in the Philippine armies who have been under stress through several projects and uh, missions that they've been through. So I think it is so important that CSOs are able to create these bridges among not just communities, but everybody in public. Now, right now also, it's been our five years in providing Eye Care Mental Health Expo, which is a public and open uh, expo that talks about mental health. And we've been, we've been doing this uh, openly and, uh, and, a more, and in a more accessible way with schools here in the Visayas, uh, informing people about mental health and ways and means to cope with different mental health problems. And I think if we can expand this kind of programs, then we can actually deliver also not just the ability to provide mental health and psychosocial support during disasters, but also provide aids to those individuals experiencing mental health concerns. Now, I believe that CSOs are very important integral part in our community. And I believe that rolling out this program is a very uh, impactful project or agenda. And I think we are very much in ourselves here in the Visayas, we are very much uh, excited to be part and to be part of this and to make sure that this can be implemented accordingly. Thank you, Sir Kirk, uh, for that reaction. No? Two things that I learned from you. Number one, you point out that there is a diverse, different approaches to whichever the government offers MHPSS services. And also you, you cited and pointed out again the need for the CISO to come in to have a unified approach to during disaster and crisis that the CSO will bridge the challenge and lobby for a unified approach of MHPSS services. Thank you, Sir Kirk. And let's proceed to our agenda number six. For agenda number six, our reactor is the Executive Director of League of Corporate Foundation. May I call on Ms. Celine Santillan. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, let me just see. So congratulations and thank you for inviting me to today's discussion to share my reaction as well. So to start off, collaborations and partnerships are based on mutually shared visions of a better community. And the corporate sector, in some cases, focuses on those nearest to them as they themselves have finite resources. Perhaps hard to believe, but there are corporate foundations whose staff contingent are not more than five and whose budgets do not increase as a practice on an annual basis. For those who are able, 
their reach goes beyond the community. They cross over to provinces and regions. They go nationwide. Elements of corporate social responsibility include the workplace and therefore the company's employees. During the pandemic, the sector reinvigorated their care and support for their employees, and I think rightfully so. The other elements of CSR are community and environment and social issues. The corporate sector has been open and has exhibited its willingness to partner, not simply be a donor, but a collaborator to CSOs, not just during the COVID pandemic, but even prior to that. In 2021, LCF reported in its mapping report that for two consecutive years in 2019 and 2020, pre-pandemic and pandemic periods respectively, the UN SDG number 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals, ranked among the top five with which LCF members aligned their CSR programs. Part of the report's conclusion states, key, and I quote, Key components of most programs involved a local partner as co-implementer because CSR teams of LCF members are generally lean. Although SDG 17 on partnerships for goals are both in the top five SDG rankings in 2019 and 2020, forging partnerships outside of LCF membership is more evident rather than forming partnerships with other members of LCF. Therefore, leery perceptions of corporates and their foundations, I think, can be overcome and should be overcome by building real relationships and understanding their mandates and realities. In direct correlation regarding collaborative efforts established during the pandemic, the Pilipinas Susugan Angkalusugan Coalition, headed by our health committee, is one such example of a collaborative effort that brought multi-stakeholders to the table to work together for the Filipino people. It aims to ensure universal health care is not simply provided and rolled out, but that it includes other components of health care, such as dental care, and that support systems and mechanisms, such as working with HMOs, HMO providers, are included in the provision of the UHC to all Filipinos especially those marginalized and in far-flung areas. The Disaster Resilience Committee is working with the National Resiliency Council to map out and reach more communities so that the LGUs and the communities are trained and prepared in DRRM. We have five other committees, Financial Inclusion, Environment, Enterprise Development, Arts and Culture, all of whom are consistently looking to partner with groups to deepen their impact and or widen their reach. Our members know all too well they cannot do it alone and that not just their sustainability, but the sustainability of the results of their efforts is integral for the community. As this is where, and this is where I mentioned resiliency as being a key component of sustainability. Engagement of the public and making certain they know who CSO are I will um, uh, just say that thanks to Dodo who mentioned this also. Um, engagement of the public and making certain they know who you are, their missions, what do you do, your accomplishments, and a good mix of resources, a variety of strong partnerships, and the ability to realign strategies while not losing one's sight on the mission and ensuring accountability and transparency are all important in advancing resilience. On a personal note, I have been advocating a healthy mix of donors for the past, well, I won't say how many decades, but more than one. Uh, but very few organizations have actually tested, much less undertaken the effort. There's lesson, there are lessons to be learned here. The League of Corporate Foundations hope to collaborate effort, uh, their efforts and go beyond provision of funding but more of partnerships and collaborations. Our members would like to partner with CSOs, other groups alongside with government to strike new paths together and that it becomes part of the new normal. So thank you very much. And this is where I end it. 
Thank you, uh, Mom Celine. Uh, just to reiterate what she mentioned, no? uh, that, that the corporate sector is not just a, a, a funder or as a donor, but uh, right now, for the past two years, they are now acting as a collaborator, a co-implementer co with CSO. And also, the, the, she mentioned about the openness of the corporate sector to partner and collaborate with uh, CSO that is very aligned to agenda number six. Thank you, Matt. Now let's go to our last agenda, uh, agenda number seven. For this particular agenda, our reactor is from the Philippine Information Agency. So may I call on Ms. Krija Kase Avihar. Hi, good afternoon. First and foremost, the Freedom of Information Philippines under the Philippine Information Agency congratulates um, Code NGO for spearheading the production and uh, the promotion of the 2021 Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index Report and the COVID-19 Recovery Agenda for the CSO sector in the country. It is an honor to represent FOIPMO and give our insights and recommendations to Agenda 7, increase the visibility of CSOs and its work of the report. So please allow me to briefly introduce my office to set the context for my reaction. So the Freedom of Information Program Management Office is the agency in charge of operationalizing Executive Order Number 2 of 2016 or the FOI program in the country. So this includes uh, maintaining the electronic FOI portal, now being for the passage of the FOI bill in the Philippine Congress, encouraging local government units to pass an FOI ordinance, ensuring um, program compliance of government agencies under the executive branch, seeking and establishing partners from both the government and um, non-government sector, and conducting capacity development activities and program awareness campaigns for its partners and the general public. So since the um, program's inception in 2016, FOIPMO has had relevant partnerships with the civil society organization. So back in 2017, Code NGO conducted its FOI practice project titled um, EO on FOI, monitoring the key promises of President Rodrigo Roa Duterte on the assistance to municipalities and war on drugs, uh, flagship programs that shed light on the CSO experience on the access to information via standard FOI and EFOI portal platforms. In 2018, um, the Code NGO is a signatory to the joint letter appeal to the House of Representatives for consideration of the House Substitute Bill on Freedom of Information for the next committee hearing. Um, Code NGO also signed the Manifest of Support for the passage of the FOI Bill in Congress in 2019 and is a participant in the FOI Training of Trainers Pilot Batch. So as the FOI program developed over time, so did its engagements with CSOs. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, our office recognized the need to strengthen our relationship with CSOs as they are um, stalwarts of the advocacy for, more, for a more transparent and accountable government operations. So this was demonstrated by our In Focus webinar series with a team capturing transparency in budgeting and public procurement processes, one of the main agendas of which was to emphasize the importance of CSOs and demanding a more transparent um, government. So moving forward, the FOI PMO held its first bridging program in 2021 in collaboration with um, the Partnership of Philippine Support Service Agencies or uh, PILSA, one of Code NGO's national members, our office also collaborated with the Philippine Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf uh, by engaging the services of uh, Filipino Sign Language Interpreters in the delivery of CSO hangouts for senior citizens, um, indigenous peoples, and the people with um, disabilities. In addition to sectoral engagements, um, FOIPMO sought the opportunity to partner with the Legal Network for Truthful Elections, or LENTE, Hirayang Kabataan, and uh, with the Youth Vote. Uh, vote PH in carrying out the FOI practice project in relation to the upcoming 2022 general elections. In 2022, our office implemented three more rounds of FOI bridging program, this time with uh, the women in conflict with the law, persons deprived of liberty and 
the persons with um, disability sector. So these were done in partnership with the Philippine Jesuit Prison Services Inc., Legal Management Council of the Philippines, and the Philippine Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. So uh, representatives from these organizations were also invited to the 2022 FY pre-summit webinar series day two with the team um, promoting inclusivity through access to information where they had the uh, opportunity to discuss how greater access to government information can help their sectors advance their social agenda. So uh, my sharing uh, brings up to two important points. So first, our office um, um, CSO engagements have improved over time. We sought the um, to interact with uh, CSOs from a variety of sectors with a special attention on the marginalized and disenfranchised um, sector as we recognize their potential to become effective advocates for the FOI program and good governance. More than that, genuine empowerment of these sectors is considered necessary to make a positive impact in the society. So second is um, our CSO engagements still have a lot for, for room for Im improvement. So from what I've shared, you may have noticed that we only tap CSOs for capacity building activities or information learning sessions. Furthermore, our CSO engagements were concentrated in Metro Manila with less emphasis on other regions. So this could be because the FOI PMO conducts the majority of our capacity building activities at the national level and has fewer CSO networks at the local level. So with this, the FOI Philippines recommends that the CSO can strengthen their collaborations with um, government offices such as the Philippine Information Agency being the premier communications arm of the government. The CSOs and the government can work together to promote programs that will benefit the Filipino people down to the grassroots level. So the PIA has regional offices that can communicate programs and services that are beneficial to the people. So the CSOs can look into localizing its programs so that they can better relate to the um, local communities. And this can also help raise awareness in the important works the CSOs do. Um, you can also translate communications into local dialects for better understanding and um, identification of programs and services that can address issues and concerns within the localities. So um, these engagements may begin with capacity building activities and may progress to partnerships. And the Philippine Informa Information Agency through the FYPMO commits to strengthen its engagement and um, collaboration with the CSOs in communicating and promoting the collaborative efforts of the CSOs and the government in nation building and highlight the positive impact of CSOs work in the society. So just to share with you, the FOI PMO has been highlighting our partnership with the CSO since 2017. So this is evident by recognizing our CSO partners during our annual FOI awards for their contribution in promoting an open and accountable government in the country. So that is all for my reaction to Agenda 7. Hopefully I was able to share useful recommendation for the body. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ma'am Cassie. Truly, indeed, uh, the collaboration that you've been doing before and ongoing is remarkable for CSO and also acknowledging that there are things that needs to be improved outside Metro Manila and the value of recognizing as well the CSO in amplifying the mandate of FOI PMO program. So thank you, Ma'am Cassie, for that. Uh, that's our reactors for Agenda 1 to 7, long discussions, but for me, it's a meaty discussion, a lot to learn, and I saw a lot of discussions in our chat box. So right now, we'll... Okay. Due to time constraints, it's, it's already past four. So let me just proceed to our program. Uh, I, I see already a lot of discussions in our chat box. So instead of uh, discussing and proceed to open forum, and maybe we'll just go directly to the synthesis and call to action. May I call on the chairperson, currently the chairperson of Code NGO, uh, Ma'am Aurora Chavez. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for that, Ellie. As our CSO SI results show, we have much to improve on in terms of legal environment, advocacy, and public image. Over the years, Code NGO organized 
public forums on the CSOSI, and we invited reactors to talk about these three dimensions extensively. Dr. Segundo Romero, or Doc Doy, columnist of the Philippine Daily Inquirer, emphasized on the following to strengthen the sectoral infrastructure of CSOs to neutralize the harsh legal environment that CSOs are facing. Building technical and organizational capacities, growing community, philanthropy, and local resource mobilization, advocating for participation in national and local governance, creating multiple, creating force multipliers for advocacy and service provision, and lastly, networking, synergizing, and scaling up. Dr. Ron Mendoza of the Ateneo School of Government highlighted building a unifying narrative around the treasured traditional values of people-centered development, community organizing, and social capital building. Today, the COVID-19 recovery agenda was launched as the response to improving sustainability and guide CSOs towards recovery moving forward. We heard from our partners and allies express support, insights, and recommendations from the Securities and Exchange Commission, Department of Budget and Management, Department of the Interior and Local Government, Department of Information and Communications Technology, Philippine Information Agency, Ateneo de Manila University, Foundation for Sustainable Society Incorporated, Just Talk Wellness Institute Southeast Asia, and League of Corporate Foundations. Thank you very much for inspiring us this afternoon with your wonderful ideas, your words of encouragement and support. We have heard much about the different programs and activities that will contribute to C CSO sustainability. We shall continue discussions with you, our key stakeholders, and other stakeholders who are not present here today and firm up our partnerships. Hearing from our key stakeholders, we may carry out the recommendations proposed to us in the past, especially on social capital building, synergizing, and scaling up programs of the civil society sector. This year, during the 7th Congress, Code NGO focused on rebuilding democracy. Democracy and democratic practices are very much related to advocacy and the legal environment of CSOs. What CSOs do about democracy also impacts public image. Dr. Julia Tehanki, political science professor and chief of party of the Participate Coalition, which aims to improve political participation through clean and transparent elections, emphasize on rebuilding the middle. In today's political discourse, there is little left of the middle ground. Everything is polarized. So we have Pula, Bilao, etc. For a democracy to be healthy, a middle ground should be established because this is where cooperation will most likely happen. This includes engaging government while ensuring it stays in the democratic lane. It would be in the interest of many that we stay as a democracy and strengthen our democratic institutions, especially if we want the civil society sector to be sustainable. We call on our key stakeholders for continued support. And I invite our civil society sector to come together for the fulfillment of the COVID-19 recovery agenda. Marhay na hapon po sa intiro, Diyos Mabalos. Thank you, Ma'am Aurora, for your wonderful closing message, synthesis, at the same time, call to action. By the way, in our chat group, there is an evaluation form. And if you want to receive the presentation, you can visit um, and message us on our Facebook page and on code NGO FB page. So once again, uh, this is also your questions. If there are questions, just message same website and the social media page. 
if you have a question to speaker, we will facilitate it to you and send directly the answer once they have their answers. So once again, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon session. Uh, I am your moderator, Elisa Binay. Maayong hapon sa tanan.